Okay, now we are streaming live. Sergeants, will you begin your recordings? Let's see, recording is up. Cloud is good. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Lugo, you may begin to open. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Reynoso, we are ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant Lugo. <clears throat> I want to start off by uh, acknowledging that we've been joined by uh, Council Members Brennan, Chin, and Riley. Um, good morning. I am Council Member Antonio Reynoso, and I am the Chair of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. Welcome to this oversight hearing on street and sidewalk cleanliness in New York City. Today, we will also be hearing intro 471, sponsored by Council Member Danny Drum, related to the pro prohibiting obstructing signs on sidewalks, flagging and curbstone. A year ago, this committee held a hearing on sidewalk and street cleanliness in the face of drastic budget cuts to the Department of Sanitation. Streets were being cleaned and litter baskets were being emptied less frequently. New Yorkers were reporting overflowing litter baskets, garbage on the streets and sidewalks, and an increase in rat sightings. Fortunately, this year's budget restored some of the funding to the department's cleaning operations and created a new precision cleaning initiative. Unfortunately, overflowing garbage baskets and street litter continues to afflict our city. Litter baskets are not being filled with litter, but in some cases, they are being filled with full bags of household or business garbage. This is illegal and is adding to the garbage on our streets. We need businesses and households to dispose of garbage properly and keep litter baskets for their intended use. Austin aside, parking was suspended for most of last summer and has been in effect with reductions for over a year now. While parked cars do not have to move so often, we need to better understand how this is affecting street cleanliness and the ability of the department street sweepers to efficiently and effectively do their job. <clears throat> if traffic patterns are back to where we were pre-pandemic, we should return to regular alternate side parking rules so that uh, to do what they are intended, help remove litter from our streets. I look forward to hearing the SNY testimony on how we as a city and as individuals can do a better job of keeping our streets and sidewalks clean. I'm interested in understanding how changes to alternate side parking rules have impacted the presence of litter in our streets and sidewalks, as well as remaining challenges to curbing unlawful dumping of household and commercial waste in public litter baskets. Now, before the administration uh, testifies, um, actually, we're just going to move forward with uh, the commissioner. Um, Sergeant, correct me if I'm wrong, and I do want to acknowledge that uh, we are being joined by Councilmember Common Yeager. Um, we've been joined by Councilmember Cabrera as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, if uh, Council Member Drum is able to join, then if you're okay with it, Chair, we will allow him to give his opening. Okay. Yes, please. All right, so thank you. I am Council Jessica Steinberg Albin, and I will be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelist will be. We will first be hearing testimony from the administration followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will not be limiting time for council member questions. For members of, public, of the public, we will be limiting speaking time to five minutes in order to accommodate all who wish to speak today. 
Once you are called on to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any, when it is your turn to speak. We will now call on representatives of the administration to testify. Appearing today for the Department of Sanitation will be Commissioner Edward Grayson, Ricky Cyrus, Assistant Chief of Enforcement, and I believe that is all from the administration. At this time, I will administer the affirmation to each representative of the administration. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Edward Grayson. I do. Ricky Cyrus, Assistant Chief. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Do you mind saying that one more time, Mr. Cyrus? I do. And I believe we have been joined by Stephen Harbin, Chief of Cleaning Operations. Do, Mr. Harbin, do you affirm to tell the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Mr. Harbin, are you able to hear? Okay, my apologies if he is not on. Um, thank you, Commissioner, you may begin your testimony. Good morning, thank you. Good morning, Chair Reynoso and members of the New York City Council Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. I am Edward Grayson, Commissioner of New York City's Department of Sanitation, and I am joined today by Stephen Harbin, the Chief of Cleaning Operations, and Ricky Cyrus, the Assistant Chief of our Enforcement Division. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the Department's efforts to keep our city clean and to provide comments on behalf of the administration on Intro 471. Our Department's mission is to keep New York City healthy, safe, and clean. We celebrated our 140th birthday earlier this year, and despite the change from the Department of Street Cleaning to the Department of Sanitation in name only, our commitment to cleaning our city has never wavered in over those 140 years. I've been a proud member of this department for nearly 23 years now, and my parents were as well for decades before me. Just about one year ago, I testified in front of this committee in my first hearing as Sanitation Commissioner on this very topic. Then, the city was on the cusp of the second wave of COVID infections without approved vaccinations, dealing with tremendous budget cuts and facing the prospect of widespread layoffs. Today, we face many of the same challenges we did a year ago, but the outlook is brighter. Our city is on the path to recovery. Our schools, restaurants, theaters, and workspaces are open. Then service cuts and manpower shortfalls combined with pandemic related increases in the use of our streets and public spaces had certainly led to more litter on our streets, overflowing corner baskets, and an overall sense that the city was dirtier than it had been in years. Today, we still face several of those challenges, particularly regarding the changes in New Yorkers' attitudes and behavior, but we have seen a dramatic improvement as well. As I will describe, several budget cuts have been restored, and we have put new programs in place. New Yorkers have joined us in record numbers to help clean up their blocks and neighborhoods, and we have honored our approach to the persistent challenges regarding illegal dumping and doing everything we can to work toward a cleaner city. This year's recovery budget released by Mayor de Blasio in April included several new and restored cleaning initiatives aimed at supporting our, our city's recovery. In the executive budget, the administration restored baseline funding for the department's litter basket collection services. In partnership with the city council, the administration added an additional 8.6 million in funding for supplemental litter basket collection, making a total of more than the 17 million in, in new or restored funding for litter basket collections in the fiscal year. Today, DSNY is funded to run 588 litter basket trucks each week, a 116% increase from the 272 trucks per week we were running in July, 2020. This additional service has contributed to cleaner streets and improved quality of life for our communities. 
The Department of Sanitation has also created the Precision Cleaning Initiative with teams to conduct targeted cleanings of litter conditions, illegal dumping, and overflowing baskets. These conditions are eyesores that affect New Yorkers' quality of life and threaten New York City's recovery. Teams are dispatched based on DSNY field observations, 311 complaints, and referrals from other city agencies and community groups. To date, PCI crews have collected more than 10,000 uh, eyesore conditions and emptied a total of 25,000 additional litter baskets citywide. We have also restored our dedicated syringe litter staff with our environmental police unit to conduct proactive patrols in areas with the highest concentrations of syringe litter. These six dedicated officers are specially trained to properly handle syringes and other potentially hazardous waste. Since the restoration in March, our dedicated team of EPU officers has collected a total of 27,485 syringes from New York City streets. This fiscal year, we have also received more than 4 million in funds from city council members through the New York City Cleanup Initiative. That's our highest total since the program began seven years ago. I thank all the members for their commitment to our mission and for their partnership as we work to keep New York City clean. All 8.8 .8 million New Yorkers, as well as the millions of visitors and commuters have a role to play in keeping our city clean. Litter and trash does not just magically appear on city streets. Each piece, bag or pile has a person associated with it. Someone who tossed it on the ground, dumped it on the corner or threw it out a car window. As we recover and move along towards post COVID, New York City, I ask all New Yorkers to do the right thing. Don't litter, use corner baskets properly, clean up after your dog, move your car for alternate side parking, sweep the sidewalk in front of your home or business, and if you see a litter condition that DSNY needs to bring attention to, please let us know by calling 311. In the past year, the department has greatly expanded our community cleanup program. Working with volunteers and community partners across the five boroughs, DSNY provides tools and operational support for neighborhood cleanups. We also introduced the community cleanup van to raise awareness and support these events. The department lends tools, trash bags, masks, brooms, dustpans, and other tools to volunteers and can now deliver these tools directly to the volunteers through the new community cleanup van. The department has partnered with an estimated 7,200 New Yorkers on 278 volunteer cleanups during fiscal year 21, which just ended on June 30th. The cleanups represent a 546% increase from fiscal year 20 and a 186% increase from pre-pandemic fiscal year 19. We encourage all New Yorkers to chip in and help us keep New York City clean. The City Cleanup Corps is Mayor de Blasio's New Deal inspired program. The Corps is intended to foster the city's economic re recovery by empowering and employing 10,000 New Yorkers to refresh and revitalize our city to make it welcoming to residents, workers, and tourists. Since its launch six months ago, the Corps, the Corps has contributed significantly to cleaning the city streets and sidewalks in neighborhoods across the five boroughs. To date, it has helped remove more than 600,000 bags of trash and cleaned over 25,000 rain gardens of trash and debris. Additionally, the Corps has been active in helping the neighborhoods impacted by Hurricane Ida. Since Ida hit, Corps members have helped remove 72,000 bags of debris and cleared rain gardens and storm drains of trash and debris to help mitigate possibility of flooding. Illegal dumping is a particularly pervasive problem in New York City today. There are any number of reasons that drive this. Unpermitted contractors renovating homes and storefronts, businesses trying to save money and not hiring a private carter, unscrupulous operators dumping in the dark of night. Illegal dumping occurs when someone removes trash from a vehicle and leaves it in a public or private space. It is a major problem in many parts of the city, leading to unsightly and unsafe conditions for residents, particularly in areas with vacant lots, dead ends, overpasses, railroad lines, and industrial zones. To combat illegal dumping, DSNY employs a team of sanitation police officers who stake out known dumping locations, investigate 301 complaints, and impound vehicles that are involved in illegal dumping activity. Fines for illegal dumping start at $4,000 and can be as high as $18,000 for repeat offenders. DSNY also conducts enforcement for improper disposal, which is a lesser violation that generally involves a smaller quantity of material and does not use a vehicle. The number of 311 requests for enforcement of improper disposal increased to 5,094 in FY21, up from 3,837 in FY19. This summer, we recently launched a pilot program of increased concentrated enforcement. 
Between late July and early August, we concentrated our efforts in Brooklyn Community Board 5 and issued 24 summonses for illegal dumping, 15 summonses for littering from a motor vehicle, nine summonses for improper disposal and additional summonses for related violations, and some higher level enforcement actions, including 16 vehicle impounds and even one arrest. We removed litter and debris from several public sites leading to cleaner and safer streets and residents in these neighborhoods. A similar enforcement surge in the Hunts Point section of the Bronx also yielded very positive results. And to date, we have issued 143 violations related to illegal dumping and impounded 83 vehicles. We hope that this increase in enforcement and potentially other efforts among the five boroughs in the coming weeks will prompt the residents and businesses to follow the rules and keep our city clean. Intro 471, sponsored by Council Member Drum, would prohibit obstructions or nuisances in or upon sidewalks, flaggings, or curbstones, streets and medians, and streets establish a hold on, and streets, and establish a rebuttable presumption regarding the responsibility, the responsibilities for the placement of the signs constituting such obstructions or nuisances. This legislation is aimed at holding the party identified on an A-frame sign known as a sandwich board sign, responsible for creating the sidewalk obstruction rather than the building abutting the sidewalk where the sign has been improperly placed. This bill would also expand in public areas for unlawful placement of A-frames to include traffic medians. The bill contains a rebuttable presumption that the individual or the business named on the A-frame is responsible for placing the sign on the sidewalk or the median. The department receives many complaints about improper placement of signs by businesses in front of other businesses in the street or on traffic medians. This practice is also readily used by real estate businesses to pro promote open houses. The department looks forward to working with the city council to move forward on this important piece of legislation. In conclusion, on behalf of our 9,700 employees, I wanna thank the city council for your support and our effort to clean our streets, sidewalks and public spaces. Our frontline workers are the true heroes in this effort, working day after day in all manner of conditions doing the tireless work of picking up litter, emptying corner baskets, and collecting our trash and recycling. For 140 years, our employees have worked to make New York City neighborhoods cleaner and to improve the quality of life for our residents and visitors. I thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning, and we are now happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Before we turn to the administration questions, I would like to turn the floor over to Council Member Drum to give an opening on his bill Intro 471. Thank you very much. And I apologize for being a little bit late. I had some techno technolo technolo technology problems with my iPad. It's great to see you, Commissioner. And again, thank you for coming out to Jackson Heights last week uh, to uh, you know, announce the City Cleanup Corps. And it, you did a fantastic job. Thank you. Clean streets and sidewalks are an environmental justice issue. Sadly, certain communities are left with inadequate resources to deal with the ever-present scourge of littering, dumping, and so on. The challenges are immense in the district I represent because not only is it an EJ community, but it is also a destination attracting shoppers from all over the East Coast. The pandemic has added new challenges to keeping our streets and sidewalks clean. This crisis has only highlighted the danger of illegal signs and other obstructions, especially as an extraordinary measure, the city has permitted the use of otherwise public sidewalks and streets for certain commercial structures. There are, however, limits to the scope and size of such accommodations to our, businesses, to our business community. Unauthorized obstructions often create dangerous bottlenecks on sidewalks. Not only does this impede social distancing, but it is especially hazardous for pedestrians who are very young, very old, and or disabled. Even before the pandemic, A-frame signs, for example, unacceptably littered my district sidewalks. This prompted the drafting of intro 471, which would prohibit the placing of signs and other obstructions on sidewalks or streets and establish a rebuttable presumption that the identifying information on a sign obstructing, obstructing the sidewalk is the party responsible for the obstruction. Many interests vie for space on our cities and streets, but we must always balance those interests with the need to maintain the health and safety of us all. 
Individuals navigating the streets and sidewalks of my district and throughout the city deserve to have sidewalks and streets clear of unnecessary obstructions. And that is what intro 471 aims to address. Thank you, Chair Reynoso, for hearing this bill. I appreciate your work throughout the years to make sure sanitation issues are a priority for this council. And thank you, Commissioner. And I look forward to working with you on um, passing this legislation. Thank you again. Thank you, Council Member Drum. I would like to now just administer the oath to Stephen Harbin, Chief of Cleaning Operations. Stephen Harbin, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you very much. Um, administration panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. We will now turn it over to questions from Chair Reynoso. Chair Reynoso. Thank you so much, Committee Council. I just wanna uh, thank uh, Council Member Danny Jump for this legislation. Um, <clears throat> I think that our sidewalks have become inundated with uh, obstructions, um, whether it's public benches, signs, poles, uh, mailboxes, uh, A-frames, you name it. It seems like every idea um, related to, you know, attempting to build convenience makes it more inconvenient for uh, pedestrians, uh, you know, dads and strollers like I am, folks in wheelchairs and so forth. So I'm extremely grateful to uh, Council Member Drum for um, this great idea. And I'm looking forward to assisting him in the passage of this legislation. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions here, Commissioner. Uh, for the most part, um, and I just want to make sure that the general public understands, practically all the money has been restored when it comes to uh, when it comes to the Department of Sanitation, um, or that we've reverted back to, to pretty much the same space we were in prior to the pandemic in the Department of Sanitation when it comes to cleaning services. Is that a, a, a true statement, more or less? Yes, Jim, more or less, that is right. Right, and when I say more or less, I'm talking about uh, the money part. Uh, we got most of the money back. Um, so I guess but I, why I'm asking that question is because the general public should assume that the city of New York should be able to return back to a, cleanly, a state of cleanliness that they were used to prior to the pandemic. That would be a fair assessment. Okay. <laughs> um, so, and, and, I, and I apologize again, Commissioner, because I, I think I'm gonna, it's something that I, I can't stand doing, but I think I need to do here because I don't have enough information. Um, and Hopefully maybe you have uh, more stats and more data that can help uh, clarify my statement is, uh, I've been talking to a few folks, anecdotally, uh, I, and they've been telling me that they still feel that the streets are as dirty um, or dirtier than they were prior to the pandemic. Um, the budget was passed on June 30th, uh, so July 1st, the increase into the budget of the Department of Sanitation, the sanitation should have taken its, its course or should have been in there. Um, so we're talking uh, several months here um, of a fully funded cleaning program with the Department of Sanitation. And it seems like the streets are still as dirty um, as they were before. So I guess what I would ask is, has I guess the cleanliness rating that exists citywide, um, how have the restorations affected that? Thank you for your question, Chair. And and I would I, I know exactly what you feel. I talk to the to the constituents. I'm out there. Um, and there's definitely a sense that people. So there's a couple of things going on. The cleanliness rating, um, our scorecard. Uh, you know, we just put out the MMR a little while ago. So we definitely finished last year uh, about two percentage points or so behind where we normally fall. Um, for the first two months of the fiscal year, we're in and around. We're about the same as we were. Um, you know, in, in the pre-pandemic. So we're, we're, but on the same token, um, that's respective of, of just one facet. That's one statistic that doesn't paint a picture of what's going on and what people see. You know, there's the, the, the concentrated viewpoint and, and the truth of objective cleanliness versus subjective opinion. And what I mean by that is that if you think it's dirty, sir, it is. I can't tell you anything otherwise. I can give you a million stats to the council today and if you feel that it's dirty, I recognize that that's the feeling, and we are definitely trying to combat that. Respectively, though, the increase in basket service, 
the PCI resources that have been able to come out and do some really targeted cleanups. Um, two things to that. What we are definitely seeing is while the restoration of a lot of our services and some new services have happened, the behavior change that occurred over the 18 months with people misusing litter baskets at a record where we had, they were just putting household refuse in litter baskets, that's that continues. Um, illegal dumping has continued. And also just in front of, on for the residential side, curbside tonnage also stays up. So more and more, we're picking up more in front of everybody's house, which means that there's just an overall continued generation increase. We haven't normalized yet. What we're hoping as we, we've only gotten, you know, now three months into this fiscal year, we're hoping to see a few things pan out as well. Um, we're coming on the back end of our hiring cycle. So thankfully um, we were able to hire new sanitation workers you know, at the end, before the winter comes in, we'll have onboarded another 840 sanitation workers. Now, what that does is that gives us the ability to fill the posts that we were not filled for last year and have more bandwidth. So more bandwidth definitely means more cleaning. Um, and I don't mean more than the budgeted. I just mean we get, in addition to what's been budgeted and what we plan to run, anytime we have an available person, we put it out on another cleaning function, meaning we run an additional broom, we run an additional basket truck, we run an additional MLP. So having the, the human beings back in and actually have them hired, because we worked throughout, we were not working remotely, not one sanitation worker couldn't was picking up garbage from home. But now that we're gonna be at a very good headcount coming in for the remainder of the fiscal year leading through winter, uh, we're very, we, we think we're gonna see some positive results that can help combat how people are feeling. I appreciate that. Um, so, so you kind of answered the second question that I was going to have. It's just that I guess it's the feeling people want to feel like they're in a clean city. Um, and you know, it's been, it's been tough. Um, I do want to talk about this, uh, precision cleaning initiative that exists, um, that is new, um, which is supposed to handle the litter legal dumping and basket cleaning services are supposed to help with that. Um, can you go through, um, very quickly, um, exactly how that program works, um, the how many staff members are in it, when and how do you feel, do you need to deploy those teams? I guess what, what systems or processes used to determine where they should be? Um, and uh, does this uh, kind of carry um, or cover some of the cleaning service programs that were not fully restored in the FY22 budget? Um, and I just said, I'm sorry, I just need to acknowledge that uh, we've been joined by Council Member Feliz and Council Member Gennaro. Thank you so much uh, for, for being on. So Commissioner, can you just go through the Precision Cleaning Initiative? And then I'm gonna ask a couple more questions and I kind of, I wanna allow for our council members that probably have tons of questions to, to get an opportunity to speak and I can come back to you later on. So just the Precision Cleaning Initiative, please. Sure, so the Precision Cleaning Initiative is approximately 54 crews a week um, that go out. So we, what we have is, and before we had the dedicated headcount, we were doing, it was an overtime program, but we were approved and now we were doing the hiring. So it's an additional 54 crews a week. How we intake those complaints are the places where we have the highest concentration of, you know, 311 complaints and or uh, council and community board call-ins coupled with naturally the DSNY field supervisors that are driving around the city all day. And we're really trying to target make sure that we have earmarked additional crews because what would happen is if we had to divert in existing resources before we implemented this PCI, we would literally be taking from a basket truck that is already overtaxed, move them over to clean up a drop off that had to be immediately handled, and then again lose productivity on both sides of the equation. And as we, one of the reasons why we're talking today, the longer something that's an eyesore sits in the street, it contributes directly to that feeling we're talking about. So the, the beauty of this program is making sure that we have these crews that we can deploy, it gets us faster. So maybe we don't have to wait a day or two to deploy. We can deploy immediately or on the next shift. So that's how we've been running this program. It's been very successful. Um, I mean, really, because in between also on ancillary travel from condition to condition, these crews pick up litter baskets along the way. So you're getting a supplemental service or a supplemental turnaround on something that normally would have sat an extra couple of hours before the scheduled service. So. It's been beneficial on not only what's been called in as the proper condition that they're responding to, but on the ancillary travel from condition to condition, these crews are making periodic stops along the way to also add value to the communities they're working in. 
really excited about that team. It makes a lot of sense. Um, instead of moving, you know, taking from Peter to pay Paul and moving resources around that way, that we actually have a team that can address that. I'm surprised we didn't have something like that earlier. So I'm very happy to see that you're, you have those resources. And now my last questions are going to come from uh, regarding alternate side parking, um, which is something that I, I am, it's just something I want to be able to deal with before I leave this council. So I, I want to talk to you about, are you letting us know, are these reforms going to be permanent is the first question. And um, how will the city make the determination to return to regular alternate side parking schedule should it not be permanent? Because at this moment, um, I guess I'll have to preface the question. It's just been, it's terrible. Um, it, in my, and, and I have to use my, the front of my house, in the front of my house, a, par a car parks there. It means that for two weeks, my street didn't get clean. It's just accumulating garbage. Um, and the, the, um, I haven't seen the same amount of fines or, or uh, the parking violations as usual. So these folks are being very bold. And because of it, we're seeing uh, just disgusting streets, um, clogged drains and so forth. So I kind of want to know, is it coming back? Um, this is my informal uh, advocacy for it to come back. Um, and what, how, how do you, how are you going to determine or what criteria you're using um, as so when you will bring it back? Chair, I, I thank you for the question. And, and you know, I definitely, uh, mechanical broom sweeping is definitely our most effective way to clean New York City streets. We have testified before the council to that fact for years. Um, and I have to tell you that, uh, the biggest issue with with alternate side parking or people moving for the broom is just that it's the the non compliance your own example was a prime the the challenge of having a reduced sweeping schedule for the parts of the city that were getting multiple times per week is that when they go to one time a week if somebody doesn't move their car now you go you now wait a whole week to get a mechanical broom and then we rely as a city um, on the homeowner or the business owner to come out and do their job on the 18 inch uh, or be subject to that violation. So mechanical sweeping is the greatest thing as a sanitation commissioner. Um, it's almost like don't ask, I'd sweep every street every day uh, because that's, I'm just, a, but like I said, that, that's not a, and that's not a cheeky way of answering the question. Um, where are we seeing the biggest impact in the community boards in the city that had multiple time sweep where we're now down to just the one day um, but it's funny because while it sounds like we're down to one day, it's not directly binary to a 50% reduction in sweeping because what happens is, is that the Monday and Tuesday schedule has been uh, reduced in every place that there was another day to sweep that street. However, we run rooms every single day. So when you think about it, uh, there are plenty of areas of the city that only had one time a week sweep. Those areas were not impacted. The weird part for us is we're seeing lack of compliance on moving in both in both all areas of the city, right? So it's not the places that only had one time a week sweep where theoretically those mechanical broom reductions didn't impact them at all. It's less compliance there and it's less compliance, which is compounded in the areas that now had multiple time sweep that only get it once. Because what we were basically getting on your block chair is another opportunity where if we didn't get them on you know, maybe we got in front of your house on Monday, but we didn't get there Thursday. But at some point in time, there was an added opportunity. However, if the person was a scofflaw, we would have missed you both days. So it's, you know, when you think about it, there is a level of, of, of compliance that's needed. That is the ultimate thing with the mechanical broom. It is our most effective tool as long as we have open curb space. Speaking about the mechanical broom program, just so that everybody understands as well, all the places, the residential streets that were signed for alternate side parking are the streets that are impacted by the reduction. The metered areas are still getting swept every day, six days a week, like they used to. The uh, open spaces, no parking anytime, no standing anytime, bus stops, all the, what Department of Sanitation calls all work, which is an open street. There, to the best of our ability, we've always gotten to those curbs as long as there was nothing blocking us while we're on our mechanical broom routes. So this really does hit only residential blocks that are alternate side parking signed that had multiple days on the same side of the street. Uh, and that's not to say, I, like I said, I miss, I miss having that opportunity, but it was just an opportunity to clean. Compliance is still the ultimate tool. Um, to answer your question, 
Will there be a restoration? Will there be a change? I do believe that there's one coming. Uh, we're still working. We're working with the administration on trying to formulate what is the right basis to judge that. Uh, there have been many uh, discussions that have happened with, is there new technology? Is there new things coming down the pipe? And I think to answer your question, sir, honestly, it's that right now, the current program is, while there are still some people who will gladly tell us that they don't quite get it, it is still the easiest one to explain. We're coming one time a week, the last day on the sign. To try to implement something that would be piecemeal, because believe me, I have parts of the city that I would love to go back to sweeping multiple times as a rule. Um, however, I don't know how to explain that outside of that community board that makes it fair for everyone to get it because it is a, there, there are laws, there's posted laws involved. And so I wanna work with the council. Uh, that's the main thing for that question I wanna put out there. And I, I, I entered, I'm definitely here to discuss the rest of everyone's concerns with it. Um, we look forward to working with the administration, to working with council to figure out what is the right program for alternate side. Um, there are parts of the city that we've learned throughout the pandemic that clearly could survive with one day a week. They really could. They had two days and they aren't dramatically impacted. Uh, now, again, I go back to objective versus subjective. To me, they don't look as bad, but if you're the homeowner, you may think it looks terrible. So again, um, we think operationally, there are parts of the city that did prove that they could go with a reduced schedule. But then there are clearly parts of the city that prove that they cannot, that that second opportunity, even though there's always the rotating X factor of compliance, that the more opportunities that are afforded to the block face would certainly help uh, combat the, the illegal, you know, the, the litter and the, the, the dirtiness. Um, and then lastly, just to alternate side, we still go back to, um, we are writing summonses. Uh, we definitely are writing summonses for it. We're not the only ones who write that summons as well, but there is the Department of Sanitation is writing summonses for littering. We are writing summonses for dirty sidewalks. We are doing what we have to do to try to encourage residents and businesses to do the right thing. We are certainly doing what we want to do uh, to the best of our ability with the people in violation of the mechanical broom uh, compliance. Because to us, though, that summons is a tool to try to help somebody move. I would much rather have compliance um, because the summons on the car still leaves dirt in front of your house. It doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem. It only gives me a way to nudge compliance. Our main goal is always compliance for a clean street. I think Chief, Chief Harbin uh, has something to say. Good morning, uh, Chair Good morning. and fellow council members. Again, my name is Stephen Harbin. I am the Chief of uh, Cleaning Operations of New York City Sanitation. I'm fairly new to this role, but as far as um, working in the field and dealing with cleaning resources, I've been with the Department of Sanitation for 32 years. And in my role, I've worked with cleaning resources. Uh, I live in Community Board 5 in Brooklyn, which is uh, one of the most, I guess what you would say, illegal dumped on community boards in the city. And it's an irritation to me, and I take it personal when people drop off things and we clean it and they drop it off again. Uh, so um, with regards to that, um, I empathize with all of you, especially in those community boards. Likewise, yourself, council member uh, Reynoso, with regards to cleaning conditions and so forth, it irritates me too. Um, I am honored that I have been picked in this role though, to uh, share the resources to get the streets clean, to get the drop-offs picked up, to get the lots clean, to get the derelict vehicles off the street. We've had some challenges, yes, just as uh, we're all aware of because of COVID cuts, major cuts that uh, greatly impeded us. But um, as you, had, you and, and the commissioner had mentioned, things are being restored. And I am looking forward to working with those resources to clear and to clean the streets of New York City. For myself, uh, to represent this great agency, to, for yourselves and for the people of New York City. And I look forward to working with everyone and working with our staff to, uh, in a collaborated, co collaborative effort to achieve this goal. And um, I'm all in for e to work with each and every one of you. And I thank you for this opportunity. Absolutely, thank you, Chief, and congratulations uh, on your new appointment. Um, thank uh, you. 
welcome to 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 the committee hearings that you'll be frequenting um, <laughs> uh, on a regular basis. Um, Commissioner, I just wanted to clarify: Do you have statistics on how many summonses have been given? Look, homeowners, uh, and I and look, I'm not a homeowner, but I live in a house, uh, and uh, if the the streets are not clean. Uh, you know, the acorns come back onto the sidewalk and uh, paper gets back onto the sidewalk and it's just the wind will bring it back up and, you know, the streets are absolutely dirty. It makes it harder for the sidewalk to ma be maintained clean. So I want to, I don't want to not admit, do enforcement on homeowners and on businesses, but the biggest problem is the city and we can't, you know, we, we can't find you um, or you can't get summonses for dirty streets because of the cars. So I want, the cars are my biggest issue, is the vehicles blocking your ability to clean these streets. So I want to ask how many summonses or the rate of summonses and whether or not they've changed uh, to pre-pandemic levels, considering that uh, the, the city has gone to pre-pandemic levels when it comes to vehicle use. Um, so it means that uh, I would expect the same amount of violations happening, if not more, considering the change in culture. Um, of vehicle, vehicle of people that have cars and that are leaving them parked? Great question. Um, yes, we are definitely writing summonses. Uh, I believe the first three months of this fiscal year, we are somewhere in the neighborhood on just on parking summonses alone for our, the statutes that we write to. I believe we're close to about 100,000 summonses so far, um, but I will ask Chief Cyrus of our enforcement division uh, to get a little bit granular, because that's a very good point. Chief Cyrus, please weigh in. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So for parking summonses, in the first three months, we have written approximately 97,395 summonses, of which is broken down in July. We wrote um, 40,469. Um, August, around 41,753. And 15,000. 173 in September so far. And uh, Assistant Chief uh, Cyrus, can you can you just uh, clarify to me how many of those summonses are for vehicles parking uh, parking violations versus homeowners? Like, to break down the homeowners versus homeowners, commercial, I guess, sidewalk versus street. I guess if you can do that. Those numbers are just for um, parking. So for oh, okay. okay for. Oath summonses in July, we wrote 25,000. In um, August, around 24,000. And in September, around 10,000. Okay. Um, and then the, uh, how many of those summonses did you write around the same time this year, two years ago? Do you have that, that information? Like two years ago, the same month to date, how many violations are written? I don't have that information with, in front of me right now, but I'm willing to get it to you. All right, Chief. Yeah, if you can, you, when you find if you find that information, can you get it to me? I have a ton of more. I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to hold back because I want my council members to get an opportunity to speak. Um, and I'll, I can always I'll be here the whole day, so I'll come back to it. So, um, Committee Council, uh, I think uh, you, Jessica is going to handle that that work. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner, and I'll I'll be back. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I will now call on other council members to ask their questions in the order they have used their Zoom raise hand function. If you'd like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please raise it now. You should begin once I have called on you and the sergeant has announced that you may begin delivering your testimony. First, we will hear from council member Cabrera, followed by council member Chin. Council member Cabrera. Thank you so much, uh, committee council, and to the chair. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, you hit in a lot of the questions that I was very interested uh, in covering. And commissioner, welcome, and to all the system commissioner. I I wanted to uh, point out first that uh, timeout uh, interview. Uh, they did a survey of twenty seven thousand. They polled twenty seven thousand city dwellers in an urban center across multiple continent. And New York City came in within the top three dirtiest, uh, dirtiest city, even though uh, 
we land in the top five cities overall uh, and the top most exciting cities in the world. And yet uh, this, is, this is something that uh, is not just perceived by New Yorkers, but from all over the world. That, that is uh, unfortunately the perception and I think in reality, a lot of uh, our neighborhoods. So I just wanted to point that out. Second, in terms of what Councilmember Reynoso mentioned, in terms of enforcement, I have to be honest with you, we need more enforcement. I mean, I, I believe that that is the problem. I think a lot of the things that we're facing in the city right now, whether it's crime, whether it's uh, related to cleanliness, is that we need to get back to what used to work. It, it worked before, why is it not working right now? I, I don't see the level of ticketing and I, I would have loved to see, and I, I, I only wish that uh, uh, your, your team will, was a bit more prepared uh, because this is the only way we could compare and contrast. But even if they were higher right now, we need to get more tickets because that's what people respond to. They're gonna respond to their wallets. Uh, and, and, and that's the only way you're gonna be able to do what you used to do before. And it worked so well uh, before. And I can't wait until we get also to the back Monday and Wednesday, twice a week, uh, and get back to, again, what worked. This is no secret uh, to uh, the, the level of effectiveness and efficiency and to the credit of the Department of Sanitation on the way you had it before. I think if we return back to exactly what we were doing before, we'll, we'll get uh, the same results. But the last thing, and I'm gonna uh, just point this out, and it's, it's more of a question, uh, last time I asked this question, I pointed out to you that the Bronx uh, proportionally has less sanitation workers than the other boroughs like Manhattan and Brooklyn. And I'm grateful that they have what they need. But our, our sanitation workers had to do double dumping of, in, in terms of the trucks. And we have less workers. Now, I, I heard you and the good news, you hire more people, but I, I imagine there was also attrition that took place. People retire. How many more prior uh, to January, how many more uh, are we over uh, the numbers that we have back in January in terms of the Bronx uh, sanitation workers? Uh Councilman, what I will do is uh, I dynamically for the Bronx, I do not have that. Um, we are going to finish our last group of new hires uh, before November. So our last class goes in in November. Your Bronx garages will definitely be probably back to full, if not a little bit over pre-pandemic staffing, um, you know, on the relative term. But I'll have a grid sent to your office, absolutely, of where, we, where the numbers sit. Commissioner, I just want to say what my goal here is not pre-pandemic. What I'm trying to say is that pre-pandemic, proportionally, proportionally, we were not getting our due. And, and what I'm hoping is that we get our due, that we get proportionally compared to the other boroughs. We are way below, way below. And the workers here in the Bronx, they know that. The, the union, uh, sanitation union, they're very well. As a matter of fact, they brought it to my attention. And, and so what I'm hoping is not that we go back to the pre-pandemic, pre that we go above that because they're doing more work here and they have more area coverage they, because, because they have to go a longer distance between stop versus Manhattan. Everything is just, you know, you know how it works. You know this better than I do. The, it's, it's the work is, I don't want to call it easier, but it's, it's more streamlined that you would, as, as you see in the Bronx, the Bronx is one of the hardest places. And this is why when there's snow, and we're anticipating more snow this year, uh, you always have to get from the other boroughs. We never have enough, never. Uh, and, and that just uh, accentuate uh, the fact that we're lacking. And I know my colleagues here from the Bronx, uh, Councilmember Felix, Councilman Riley and others uh, share the same sentiment that we, we here in the Bronx, and this is the overall story with just about everything, it's a bit frustrating uh, that we don't get a fair share. And that's all we are asking for. We're not asking for more, we're just asking for 
fair share proportionally to other borrowers. Understood, sir. Thank you for your question. I will Thank get you some manpower numbers, though, so you can see it. I appreciate that, Commissioner. I appreciate your follow-up. You got it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much. Too, no, thank you, Councilmember Cabrera. I really appreciate your questioning. And I guess uh, I want to share in the sentiment to kind of be a part of this caucus um, of returning Alton and Sada Street parking uh, to normal because I think the mayor um, is making a decision based on politics as opposed to it being on, on data and information. I believe Mayor de Blasio thinks the city of New York is very grateful that Alton and Sada Street parking has been uh, reduced. Um, and I think it made sense during the pandemic, but now that we're, um, you know, coming out of it, or at least uh, when it comes to vehicle usage, we should re rethink whether or not that's politically savvy or, or, or makes sense. Um, <clears throat> and I'm also part of the Ticket More Committee uh, uh, Caucus as well. Uh, council Member, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Committee Council. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Council Member Cabrera. We will next hear from Council Member Chin followed by council member Riley. Council member Chen. Thank you. Thank you, chair. Thank you, commissioner. Good to see you. Um, I have two questions. One is that rat problem, especially now with all these open restaurants and in the residential neighborhood in my district, that's the biggest complaint that we get. Uh, the rats are rat, you know, running around and the garbage situation. Um, because there are a lot of these um, open restaurants. And so I want to see like how sanitation is working with the businesses to make sure that they clean up uh, after themselves so that we can alleviate this problem. And my second question is on the syringe collection, because um, you were talking about, you know, sanitation was able to do the, the collection. And in my district, we've been asking for a uh, syringe box especially in uh, Saturday Rosso Park. And the residents there has been, you know, asking for um, that service. Do the park, do you work with the parks department to, you know, correct, you know, to collect syringes in, in the park area and the playground? So those are my two questions. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Councilwoman. Um, first and foremost for the open dining and so we, our enforcement division goes out and makes sure that all the restaurants have a private carter who's supposed to service their business as always. Um, and additionally, we are doing the, our regular code enforcement for the dirty area during the commercial routing times. Um, what have, we definitely have seen and what everybody can see is a definite change in behavior on the streets that are hosting an outdoor structure. This, the place of the set out may have changed simply because normally, let's say a business would have put their, their garbage out right directly in front of the store. Well, if now if there's a dining structure there, they're gonna put it off center or you know, to the next available open space. Um, to that end, uh, that's been something that's happening along the streetscapes, but for the enforcement of what we do with that, uh, all the commercial garbage, uh, we do Carter enforcement regarding, we go in and we check storefronts and we talk to business owners to make sure that they have the private Carter and a schedule that can meet their needs. And number two, we can write summonses if they don't. And we have written summonses for those who fail to produce the fact that they have a carter that services their material. And additionally, we can write for the cleanliness of the front of the property. And we definitely, um, I would definitely like to know exactly what blocks are. And I know that's widespread, but if you have definite places where you can point out, please definitely get it to our team here so we can work on something with you in your neighborhood that could be a little bit more tailored. Perhaps it's messaging. Perhaps we could do some, another thing where we give literature out to make sure that the business owners understand what the rules are. Um, we're not against summonsing at all, but I wouldn't mind doing any walkthrough with you or you could just forward us your hotspots and we can just send Chief Cyrus's people in to do some education. I just want to definitely make sure that we're going out there armed with the ability to properly communicate what the problems are. Um, that's to the first question. To the second question, um, we do work with the Parks Department. Most of the time, it's to get the litter, to the syringe litter that's in and around that's not in a sharps container. We do not put out sharps containers for uh, public drug use, so to speak. That's not part of a program that we host. However, we do go to known, right now the syringe team has been going around to areas where it's been observed with as large amounts of syringe litter. Um, from what is perceived to be public drug use. And we go and we try to proactively clean that up. Uh, we worked in a few playgrounds. So if this is uh, in, in other parts of the city, 
just on request. We can certainly work with the Parks Department. We can certainly work with any council member who has a, a place that they know is a hotspot for what is public drug use. It's naturally part of a bigger team effort, so to speak. Why is there public drug use? The, you know, the other things that we're there for the back end to try to make sure that any of the syringes that are left, we can pop, properly dispose of and keep the, not, not just the eyesore, but any health conditions that could arise from that. That's our main focus, but we would gladly work with you to find out where that is. And we can certainly, discuss with our partners in parks if there's another program that they're hosting. Like I said, we don't host putting out sharps containers publicly, but we go by, this team goes by and does proactive sweeps in known areas where there's drug use. Okay, yeah, we'll we'll definitely follow up with you um, okay. to work on that. Because especially, you know, the right issue is that these, the restaurants are in residential neighborhoods. You know, you have, you know, resident upstairs, like especially in the Low East Side, right. my district, and you know we had issues with bars, and now the open restaurant it just really add to it. So we definitely will follow up with you to work on it. Thank you. You got Thank it. you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And I just want to the the best way to handle the rat problem is called containerized waste. This is one of the only large cities in the world that doesn't do containerized waste. Um, which would make it so impossible pretty much for any vermin to be able to eat or, or get into our garbage system. Um, I've been trying to push that for quite some time here uh, and haven't been too successful because I don't know who carries that bill. But um, whoever carries that bill, we should be pushing it forward because containerized waste is the way of the future and it'll make the job easier actually for the Department of Sanitation while also reducing um, the numbers of rats that exist in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Chen. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Chin. We will now hear from Council Member Riley, followed by Council Member Feliz. Council Member Riley. Thank you, Council. Uh, can you hear me well? Good. Uh, thank you, Chair Reynoso, and thank you, Commissioner uh, Grayson. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I would like to thank Commissioner Grayson. The sanitation has been amazing in my district uh, with helping me out with a few issues, uh, such as uh, uh, cleaning up uh, areas where a lot of pollution is going, such as furniture and, and TVs. Uh, my question um, kind of piggybacks off of Councilmember Chin. Uh, there's a huge rat issue that's going on in my district now, um, predominantly uh, residential. These rats kind of look like cats. They're huge. Um, and they're like going through um, different houses. Uh, um, so just wanted to, uh, I guess you kind of answered uh, what, what you're doing to kind of address that. Um, my follow-up question is also abandoned cars. Uh, there's a ton of abandoned cars in my district, especially during COVID, uh, being that a lot of individuals couldn't go to the DMV. Uh, is there any update on what sanitation is doing about abandoned cars? And also under the underpasses of a lot of uh, subway stations in my community is a, a ton of garbage. And, and that's one of the locations that sanitation has helped me out with. But I just want to know um, if the council members don't get in contact with sanitation, is there any procedures that you guys kind of go under these underpasses and clean them out? If you do, is that once a week, once a month? What is that um, procedure? Um, look like. Thank you, Councilman. Um, and thank you for your partnership uh, and your leadership. You've definitely pointed us in, in towards a, a, a number of conditions that it was great that we could work together and get it cleaned up. Um, to the rat problem, uh, number one, first and foremost, it's definitely if you're going to talk to your constituents, um, you know, the way that they set out, if there's any way potentially that they could take more and more of a shift to if there may be in, in areas where we have more plastic bags set out in the residential side as opposed to garbage cans set out. And I'm not talking about a steel trap. I mean, even just a receptacle. Sometimes that helps because it's clearly easier for vermin and vector to get into a three mil plastic bag than it would be to be in a, into a container. So there's some messaging that we can certainly put out on our end as well to encourage people to whenever possible use a receptacle as opposed to a bag, particularly in the rat areas. The other thing I want to definitely point. I'm you sorry, to Commissioner is, Commissioner Grayson. I'm sorry. Can you just repeat that? Um, that's information I've never heard um, of. You're saying in residential areas, for example, if you could put out your entire uh, basket, the entire the actual trash can, you guys would prefer that than just the loose pieces of of uh, um, uh, bags. Well, preference is 
to what if you have an area where you have a lot of rats eating from the street, then theoretically, I mean, I'm just the can would be better. So we would service the can for them. Uh, this is respective to the homeowner. Um, a lot of people don't if you don't have the storage, we see a lot of places that have high density, so to speak, or middle density where it's multi unit homes. If you don't have a ton of storage to put out 15 cans, you're going to put out a bag, you know, a set of bags. It really depends on the respective property owners ability to store it in between collection dates. However, if they put it out in a can, we would service the, we do both types of set out. We service the cans that are at the curb and we also service the bags that are at the curb. This is an encouragement for anybody who, if you're saying that you notice that the rat population is up or those are the complaints, you can ask the constituents that you're talking to, how do you set out the garbage? Do you put it out just the bag from the kitchen or do you put it out? Well, in I, I know I know a lot. Uh, I know personally on my block, a lot of people do the garbage bags, but they do not do the cans because sometimes, and I don't want to put a blame on sanitation because I know that they're kind of rushing, but sometimes when they do put the cans out, their cans might end up in the street um, because it could be windy that day. There's no garbage in it. So it kind of flies around. So I know that was the issue why a lot of constituents aren't putting out the cans. But maybe there's a way we could kind of figure out, you know, how they could put out the cans more than the bag. But I do agree that I think the cans would be a better um, suit. But also, I so also, I was, I also thought that the sanitation uh, workers preferred the bags over the cans. So, so I'm just trying to uh, use this as a learning and a teachable moment uh, because I, I thought, you know, it was always more convenient for bags than it is for, for trash cans as well. And I know, Councilman Riley, you got all the time in the world, so don't feel like... Um, oh, no, 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 go ahead, okay. go ahead, Chair. Right. It's all right. All right. Oh, no, no, Chair, I appreciate the context. So, so being a former sanitation worker, I can tell you that moving throughout the route, if I don't have to make the return trip with the can, you know, because if I take the can from the curb and bring it to the truck, I have to bring the can back. That's part of my job. Yeah. So every time I'm on a block where there's bags set out and I don't have to make the second trip back, hooray for me. However, but I'm, not, I'm not trying to be cheeky. That's great because it, it leads to one less trip back to the curb. However, what I'm saying is speaking in context, if you notice on a particular block, you're talking to a constituent that says, I have a lot of rats around here, then while we would, while it may be easier for me, your sanitation worker to go only once to the truck instead of twice to bring your can back, I would rather you not have rats. Therefore, what I'm saying is, we'll, if you put out a can, I'm, put, I'm picking it up either way. You know, that's the way. So now this really does split the baby to the point of what is right for the respective constituent in their setup. We also do definitely recognize that there are homeowners that just do not have space. So for them, they don't want to host a can. They want to be able to just take the kitchen bag. You know, they could store two bags and then bring it out. We understand that. And we're going to come by and clean it up. However, speaking solely to any place where you're concerned or uh, any council member has a constituents that are concerned about vermin or vector, a can may help alleviate some of the opportunities for them to interact in front of the house. Or naturally, I am not an expert on the way rats behave, but clearly food source and the availability of it is going to change the way that they do behave. If they have less availability, they should, by proxy, be less in front of the property or they'll just move on. Uh, the only thing one, the one thing I do want to circle back to, though, Councilman Riley, is make sure that I, I want to know where your hotspots are for that, because we also partner with the Department of Health. And maybe there's some more baiting or some other things that we could do directly okay. to the actual rat population, because that's where we we're about the litter. And then the abatement of rats is through the health department. Like we don't have okay. exterminators that go out. They have the teams that look at that. So that's another resource that I definitely want to know where your challenges are. Um, to the MTA properties or the underpass properties, if they are city owned, I mean, we're driving past them anyway. Uh, so what we do is we do make those observations. We encourage our partners that own, that may be the responsible party for that property, AKA the MTA, state DOT, et cetera. And we say to them, hey, do you notice this dirt and litter or drop off or unsafe condition on your property that's an eyesore to New York City you know, residents? And we encourage them with in writing calls, et cetera, to do the right thing. Uh, we also work through, um, through you know, intergov to try to get uh, more of that communication happening. What winds up happening sometimes is we work together locally and we just cross that imaginary line and go clean it up. Now, what happens is, is that it takes us a while to schedule that because number one, it's an now it becomes a, a, a scheduled cleanup with department resources that we weren't planned for, but we go do it because we want to take care of the mess. You know, and a lot of times public spaces that have this dividing line that is uncertain, 
that's where it winds up. It winds up in a quagmire where you're now telling us, hey, can you help me clean this up? And it may or may not be definitively DSNYs, but then we wind up trying to do all we can to help. Um, and by the way, I looked, I, I, that is something that we've done for years, my entire career here. We have worked locally and tried to encourage our partners, you know, whether it be the state government, federal government, MTA, whoever owns respective said piece of land that should be doing it with their resources to not right. tax us to do okay. it. But we try to work on it. And the abandoned cars. Abandoned cars. Um, big problem, definitely. Uh, we've definitely seen that. Our challenge, we're doing a lot of great work. We, we Our tag and tow operations were diminished throughout the pandemic. Thankfully, we've been able to do a lot more of them. Uh, we And the, the numbers are looking good as we lead into the rest of this fiscal year and moving onward. The big challenge with, with for, for the department with abandoned vehicles is if it has a plate on it, even if, and I'm gonna say this frankly, even if from the outward appearance, anybody could decipher that it's a fake license plate. You don't need to be a trained professional. It looks that cheesy and fake. It could even be a vanity plate that says, this is a fake plate. If it has a plate on it, it is now, I can't tow it. I can't deem it derelict. It has to meet specific criteria. So we work with the PD, the wheelhouse officers, to try to identify cars that are parked there, that we get the feedback on illegal cars, on elite people who haven't moved the car. If it's got a displayed plate, all I can do is summons it for not moving for the broom or not moving because it's too parked too close. But we work with PD on the ones. As far as the derelict vehicle go, if it's derelict and we call it in, we get that towed. All we need is six hours of turnaround time. And if it's something that's completely abandoned, we have a very high turnover rate on what we tag and what gets removed. The bigger challenge in many neighborhoods throughout the city is what is clearly people using their vehicles either as a temporary shelter or they're just, there's a lot of cars out there or the advent of the people who are parking illegally on the street because they're into some kind of selling the car or various uh, parts of repair where they leave the car parked on the street with a plate displayed and then I can't tell it. But we do, we definitely work with the wheel officer and our number of derelict vehicles removed and tagged and towed has significantly gone up. And I think we're going to get back to pre-pandemic levels, if not more than that, because that's also subjective to how many instances are reported. But we're, we're in a good place to start that, to be in a, in a really have higher numbers and be able to respond more quickly into the rest of this fiscal year. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair Renoso. Thank you, Councilman Riley. And we've also been joined by Councilmember uh, Dharma Diaz as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Riley. We will now hear from Council Member Felice. Thank you so much, everyone, for this very important hearing. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee Council. And also thank you to the Department of Sanitation for all the work they do in our city. Uh, so I have a few questions about garbage dumping problems. And my apologies if someone already asked them. I actually had another meeting, so I had to jump on about 20 to 30 minutes after the questions uh, started. Uh, so in some areas of our city, there are literally mountains of garbage due to illegal dumping. It's so bad that it, it seems like the people doing the garbage dumping, it seems like they literally think that it's legal due to the fact that there's very little to no uh, enforcement. Um, they come at all hours of the day and literally dump garbage, everything on the list mattresses, toilets, furniture, everything. So my question is, can you give us a breakdown of tickets and summonses that you've given out by borough? So for example, 20,000 in the Bronx, 20,000 in Brooklyn. So breakdown of the amount of tickets and summonses that you've given out. Thank you, council member. Um, yes, we can do, we can give you some granularity. I'm gonna ask Assistant Chief Cyrus, he runs our enforcement division. Um, his team goes out and fights illegal dumping. They're the ones that do the impounds. They're the ones that write those summonses. So we're going to give you some granular details on where we are currently. And he'll also tell you where he thinks we're headed. Chief? Good morning again. So, so far for this year, we have given out 122 summonses for illegal dumping. Um, we have impounded 87 vehicles throughout the city for illegal dumping. The thing with illegal dumping is most time we would have to catch them in the act. We have moved into um, surveillance cameras where we can use the cam 
video recording, if we can clearly see the license plate, we can clearly see that the person took the item out of that vehicle, whether it's a trunk, left side, right side. Um, then once we locate that vehicle, we can impound that vehicle. The responsible party is the vehicle owner. It's just like the regular um, red light ticket or bus lane ticket. The owner of the vehicle is responsible for that ticket. So the owner of the vehicle is responsible for um, whoever dumps with it. These summonses start, the first offense start at $4,000. Chief, I think uh, just uh, to follow up, I think one wants a breakdown of by borough, but also can you further explain that illegal dumping has to happen through vehicles? Um, if a person, an individual walks up and dumps something, what is that called if, if there is no vehicle? That's called improper disposal. So if I walk out of my house and take my bag of garbage and I put it on the corner basket, that's improper disposal. If for illegal dumping to happen, it has to be from a vehicle. So a breakdown- and Can you talk about the difference in fine structure for those two? So like if I go in with my bag and I throw it in, I get fined how much? If I come, if I put it in my car, open my trunk and then throw it out, how much are the difference in, in, in fines for that? So the difference in fine, it ranges from improper disposal is $100 to a maximum $250, $300. For illegal dumping from a vehicle, it starts at $4,000 and it goes all the way up to $18,000. And illegal dumping from a vehicle, if me, my brother, my cousin go and dump, that's an individual ticket for each person. So if, you, if we catch three people in that particular vehicle, then it will be $4,000 summoned for each person in that vehicle. Yeah, so so you mentioned 122 summonses. Is that for the whole year, for 2021? Yes, that is for year today. And how many of those have been in the Bronx? How many summonses of those? We've had 23 of those summonses in the Bronx. Okay. Okay. My next question is, is there a process that the Department of Sanitation follows in high dumping areas. So for example, uh, uh, automatic process where, you know, new cameras are installed and, you know, some enforcement tools are also installed to hopefully, you know, put an end to that problem. So yes, we have our task force that monitors certain areas in the city every night. Um, we've had specific blitz in certain place, in certain neighborhoods in the past month. So in August, we had a blitz in, uh, in Brooklyn 5, Committee Ward 5, which we had 16 um, impounds, 27 illegal dumping summonses were issued. We issued 15 violations for littering from a vehicle, and we even had one arrest. And we did the same thing in Bronx, in Bronx 2 at the end of August, which we had 19 impounds, 15 illegal dumping um, violations, and nine summonses were issued from dump, um, littering from a vehicle. We, got, we, we plan on moving throughout the city in different neighborhoods. How we come up with the neighborhood is from our offices going out and do investigations. We get it from council members, community boards, 311s, and just the community members reporting to us, telling us where there are problems so that um, we can go out and attack illegal dumping. Okay. Yeah. No more questions. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if uh, Councilman Feliz said okay. It didn't seem confident there, Council Member. Um, I guess. I guess. I hope Chief and, and Commissioner. I hope you guys hear the common thread here of a want for more enforcement. That hearing that when he heard the number twenty-two in all of the Bronx, it, it seemed underwhelming, um, and it almost makes it feel like. You know, considering the amount of illegal dumping that he's witnessing, um, that 22, you, you might be able to just do that in his district alone. So, um, but what you're saying is now that there is a way, if we get you a camera. Um, so I guess what I want to ask that I, I have, I think, installed at least 12 cameras for the NYPD here in my district. Um, if one of those cameras is located by a site that gets a significant amount of illegal dumping, can you use those cameras to identify vehicles 
in which illegal dumping has happened, or are you going to need an independent camera to do that work? At this time, we need an independent camera because we don't have access to, to NYPD's camera. If However, council, to... Councilman, I want to jump in just so that we, I'm thrilled to know that you have additional cameras placed that you funded yeah. and added to the community. And we will certainly continue that conversation where the chief was starting, because if there is available imagery that we can have access to, we will gladly include that into our enforcement program, because what we now have is the mechanism via the legislation that we can enforce off the camera. So I don't believe that I need to overall, and I'm saying this without mm -hmm. discussing it with my lawyers, but just like you're assuming, I am also assuming that if there is available cameras that I can get the imagery from, we can proceed down a path of enforcement. Even if it just gets us on the right investigative start, we could certainly use that footage to start either an investigation, if not directly enforce off of that imagery. That's good. That's good to know, Commissioner, because um, I'm learning a lot. Uh, been doing this for what seven and a half years, and I learn something new every day when I get at these committee hearings. Um, I didn't know that. I thought you had to be caught in the act, and that you couldn't use cameras. That it had to be. You had to. I know the dog, the dog poop is the one that I remember that you got to catch them in the act that even a camera doesn't work. Um, you know, we're trying to solve for problems here. So for hearing this stuff um, is really helpful um, uh, to me and I hope to to other council members. Um, uh, so thank you. Thank you for that. And I don't know, Councilman Feliz, if you have any follow up or you feel okay. You're good. All right. All right. Committee Council. All right, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Council Member Felice. Um, we will now hear from Council Member Dharma Diaz. Council Member Diaz. Count Council Member Diaz, one moment, you need to be unmuted. Thank you. Pleasure to repeat myself because it's worth saying twice, if not three times. Thank you, Chair, for this much needed conversation. I want to thank the Commissioner Grayson for working with us so closely in Community Board 5, where at one point they had the most dumping in New York City. So it seems my question was going to go more toward cameras. Again, thank you, Chair, for bringing up the conversation about cameras. It's definitely much needed. I, Diaz is kind of getting tired of driving around the district and identifying. So if we can figure out a way to get cameras, it, it would be amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member, Council Member Diaz. Um, I think there's a revelation, uh, Commissioner Grayson, uh, related to these cameras. Uh, I really think folks are like, my precinct is gonna hear from me. Um, I have one dumping site that's right next to a camera. And uh, you know, uh, now that I know that I'm going to ask my precinct if they can give access to the garage or to the supervisor or whoever. And I'm, I agree with you that um, it might not be something we do readily now, but once uh, I call the mayor's office and let them know that I would appreciate if the NYPD give access to the Department of Sanitation for that, I don't see it being a problem, uh, but it could help solve a lot of, a lot of issues. Uh, Cause I think again, enforcement is the biggest issue we're having here. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. Uh, committee council, is there any other council members that are looking to ask questions or a second round? Uh, Chair, I see council member Feliz's um, Zoom hand is raised. So council member Feliz, please ask your questions. Thank you. Um, so could you give us a breakdown or a, a brief summary of the caught in the act rule? Is that for summonses or is that to impound the vehicle? Catch the act dumping garbage. Understood. Uh, I appreciate the question. And again, I'm going to have Chief Cyrus. Chief, take it away. But it depends on the, the type of violation. We have action violations. And these action violations, you will have to catch that person in the act. As we talked about um, K-9, um, improper disposal of somebody's dumping something into a little basket, we can that can be caught in the act. Or if there is mail in that little basket, we can write an S2P or S16 for that violation. So only the action violations, we have to catch them in the act. The other violation, we can write them to the property. Okay, so if someone's dumping garbage in the Bronx and you don't catch them in the act, you wouldn't be able to give them a summons? As it depends on the type of 
violation. If it's just improper disposal, no, we wouldn't be able to do them summons unless we catch them in the act. Okay, so under what conditions would you be able to give a summons for a garbage dumping without um, catching someone in the act? So if if in that bag that that person dropped into the litter basket, we open it and we find some kind of identifier, whether it's a box from Amazon or a mail, we can write a violation based on that. But we have to find something that would identify that person as where the, the garbage is coming from. What about someone coming with a truck or a car and dumping garbage? So we, we, if we catch them in the act, we can impound that vehicle. But if there is some kind of video surveillance, if we have a camera in that location and we can identify them off of that camera, um, we can get that information. But, that, but we clearly have to have the plate and we have to see where the person is dumping that um, debris from. Also, if I may, if I may add some other context, Chief, remind them about the affidavit that can be also filled out, which is now after the fact by a witness. Right. So if if someone witnesses it, they can fill out an affidavit. We um, they get in contact with us, we provide them with an affidavit, and we can write a summons based on that person's eyewitness account. Okay. And you also mentioned that last year, well, this year so far, you've given about 122 summonses and about 20-ish were in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. um, how would you describe the current enforcement tools that we currently have and how much of that is allocated to the Bronx? Can you repeat the question? I didn't hear you correctly. Yeah, so could you describe the current enforcement tools that, that we have now and also kind of brief, roughly describe how much of that is allocated to the Bronx. So cameras, um, people, I guess, patrolling an area to see if they catch someone in the act. So in terms of sanitation police, we have nine sanitation police and two lieutenants assigned to the Bronx. Enforcement agents, we have two lieutenants, six sergeants, and 24 agents assigned to the Bronx. At this time, we don't have any cameras in the Bronx. We are still in the infancy stage of our cameras. Um, we currently have four cameras that we are using, and those four cameras are between Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. We are in the process of um, working with vendors to see which economically how it will work for us to purchase more cameras. At this time, the cameras that we purchase cost around $10,000 each. We are working with two vendors right now, um, which are looking very promising. We have a pilot program that we should be starting sometime this month. We're waiting on the vendor to supply us with four cameras. And hopefully we'll be able to use those cameras. We, those run in the cost of around six to $8,000. Hopefully they will be, they would work for the particular needs that we have. Um, and we also working with another vendor to see how we can streamline um, pricing so that we can purchase more cameras in the not too distant future. So we asking you guys uh, where you can help us fund these cameras because- and you know, What do these cameras do, uh, Assistant Chief? Cyrus, what do they do exactly? So we put those cameras in the dead ends or known dump locations. And the ones that we have right now, we have a live stream of it. So we can sit at the office or we can sit two or three blocks away from that location when we can see the activity that's happening in that area. Um, we've had incidents where our members were patrolling on one side of the, the neighborhood and illegal dumping was happening on the cameras on the other side and we were able to go and catch them in the act. So these cameras have uh, video surveillance cameras and we have live feeds that is monitored at our headquarters and it's monitored in the field um, via a mobile app. So to add some context, just to paint a picture, um, the, the, our ability to write summonses and do enforcement after action off of a camera is relatively new. So we're in the process of figuring out 
the right way to get these cameras in. Where does the funding come from? Uh, right now we have partnerships and we're trying to leverage existing cameras, much to what you mentioned, Chair, like there are other cameras out there. So we're trying to make it scalable, prove out the enforcement angle on it with regard to, there, it's circumstantial. So we have to capture a plate and that plate has to be able to be traced back to someone so that we can do the after action enforcement similar to a red light summons, where you take a picture of the plate and then no matter what, whoever owned the vehicle is presumed to have some culpability in how that illegal dumping occurred because their vehicle was used in illegal dumping. So we have a couple of things that are really what she Cyrus said earlier, we're at our infancy, but we're looking to continue to expand what the program can be. So between the fact that we can use the cameras for proactive enforcement to what the chief's point was, we can actually see if we're patrolling somewhere else, we can get alerted that there is a illegal dumper at another part of the neighborhood that we're patrolling in and go make that happen, that interaction happen in real time. Or if for some reason it is, it misses our opportunity to respond, hopefully the camera can grab, while we still have to clean it up, the camera can grab the information where we can then go after the fact and at least do summonsing or enforcement on the illegal person who dumped. So it helps on both real-time enforcement and after action enforcement, whenever the circumstances marry up to the camera being viable and the image captured being viable. So it really does have some widespread potential and we are definitely looking to expand the use of it as a tool to help combat illegal dumping and help give the at least knowledge out there to the people who do illegally dump that while we may not be there there is someone watching and that it's not a it's not a it's not it, we might not always be there to make the impound or arrest or have that in-person interaction but we certainly would have the ability now at least to go and find you afterwards so, so it's this definitely going to be a tool to move forward with so, Commissioner, you're about to open up Pandora's box here. Um, are these cameras capital eligible? So, should a council member want to give the Department of Sanitation $80,000 for eight cameras to put in an area that has a lot of dumping? Do you know if OMB would approve that, that uh, designation by a council member? Well, we just announced with Councilmember Moya in Queens that he's buying us 10 for $100,000. So I'm going to say yes. That is, this is, this is good news. Uh, you're, you're in for a treat, uh, Commissioner Cyrus, if you like cameras. Because uh, you just, because uh, I did not know this. It's a new program, obviously, but I did not know that we can. So we gave, I give the police department a lot more than $100,000 for 10 cameras, um, uh, I get, <laughs> trust me, I give them like <laughs> 250,000 for, for like four cameras. Um, so this is like chump change to solve for a problem that we've had on for a long time. I'm really excited about this opportunity. I'm upset that I don't have any more uh, council uh, uh, budget seasons to be able to help out and then the next council member is gonna take credit for it. But um, I'm re I, got, I, I personally have three sites in my district that are out of control um, and arguably might have 10 sites um, in the district that should use, should need cameras. So I'm definitely gonna let the future council members know, Councilman Feliz gets to be on the ground floor of this. So congratulations to you. Uh, but uh, this is very interesting and uh, I'm really excited about the opportunity for that. So so thank you for that information. Um, you know, Chief Cyrus and Commissioner Grayson, I think this is a uh, good news for me um, and good news for New York. Uh, Councilman Feliz, uh, go ahead. Yeah, one final question. So would you say that the cameras, that that is the only tool missing for us to be able to finally, once and for all, resolve that problem, the garbage dumping problem? We've had garbage dumping in some areas for many years, if not decades. So I'm just wondering what exactly is needed and whether the, the cameras are done. I appreciate the question. And I want to say wholeheartedly that cameras are not a silver bullet. They're not the missing tool to end it. Because unfortunately, as long as uh, I'm going to arguably say you're younger than me, sir, but for my 45 years as New York City, you know, in and around the boroughs, um, I can tell you now that illegal dumping happens because we have bad actors out there. So cameras do not stab, stop bad actors, but they certainly will help us. The other thing that I'm thankful for, and we get to inv we get to move forward at, with this. Right now, we're onboarding, you know, one of our last groups of hiring. To that end, we get to now give some enforcement personnel 
allocate you know new enforcement team members for his sanitation police and chief cyrus's you know wing of the department and we're also looking to onboard more sanitation enforcement agents so it is a tool in the toolbox number one we need people to actually become better actors so we need those are illegally dumped anything that's illegally dumped or improperly disposed of you know and the nomenclature therein that's by done by someone making a terrible decision that impacts the quality of life for the neighborhood that they happen to be in so we need them to do their part, but when they don't, we need the resources, which is can't, which, which helps with the PCI teams that we've had to go out and do more. Um, we need Chief Cyrus to have his head count so he can do more sweeps. And again, the advent of cameras all moving towards a direction. I, like you, one day hope that illegal dumping never happens. Um, and hopefully maybe this is the start of, you know, the next round of the city that we can totally stomp it out. I really do hope that that happens. I don't think that cameras is a silver bullet, but I got to tell you, and the chairman brought it up, um, this is relatively new for us to be able to do this. And I'm excited to see what we can do to really uh, further refine what the final solution on cameras and cleaning. What does that look like? Is there, you know, we have to be evolutionary with the people we serve. So how do we continue to move forward? I think this, this next step with the cameras is definitely going to be a huge help for us. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Feliz. Um, it looks like we have another question or two from Council Member Diaz. Council Member Diaz. Thank you. My question is for Assistant Chief in reference to the cameras. So I have a hot spot. You guys do an amazing job. Six months later, I have a we have, to, is it possible to move the camera to another condition, another spot? Hey, you know what? That was not Fulton in Pennsylvania anymore. It's Broadway Junction. What's the, what's the process, if there is a process? The cameras we have are very mobile. We can move them from location to location. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> so that wouldn't be an issue. Wonderful. Then my, my second question would be, I rent, I go to budget, I rent a, a truck, I'm observed, I, the cameras catch that I dumped. Will the summons be given to budget because they own the vehicle or would Dharma's, because I rented, yeah, my driver's license attached to it, I would also be given a summons or they summons for the dumping. In, in situations with a rental vehicle, we would have to catch them in the act. Um, at this time, we cannot write that summons to budget because they rented that vehicle to me or somebody else, and I'm the bad person. At this time, the law is going to allow us to go into budget and get your information and write them a summons from that. So for rental companies, we would have to catch them in the act in order to impound the vehicle and write the person who rented the vehicle that summons. Okay. Thank you for confirming where. What I have heard, Chair, maybe it's got more conversation for us to have in the future, because definitely it's an issue, at least in my district it is. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, uh, Assistant Commissioner Cyrus should get a percentage of every camera that gets bought moving forward, uh, because he did a great pitch, but also Councilman Diaz just talked about, that's a new piece of legislation there. Is there anything we could write legislatively that makes it so that Department of Sanitation could reach out to budget, there's a credit card on file, they could charge the person um, directly through their credit card for all I care or no. Uh, but uh, I wanna, Councilman Diaz uh, is a good point here. Most of the, a lot of the illegal dumping that happens are on like these these uh, rented U-Haul trucks um, and not necessarily a personal vehicle. So um, that's good to know and it, it's interesting. Um, and, and we wanna be as helpful as possible. So any ideas you, the Department of Sanitation has, Please keep letting us know. We'll do what we can to, to make your life easier, um, for sure. But just my, my understanding is Diaz rents a vehicle to get to summons. Budget will go after Diaz to pay that summons. So it's not clear to me why it's not interchangeable. But we'll no, no. So no. So you can't. You can't. You got to get if you're caught, uh, council member. If you're caught in the act, yes. But if you're in a video, for example, they can't. Right. There's nothing they can do. So I want. I want to get yeah. caught in the act and the video. Um, so, so I agree. All, uh, all hands from, on deck. <laughs> from right, from our point of view, we would love that 
to be able to go to budget, get the information from that person and be able to write that person a summons. But at this time, unfortunately, we cannot do that. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member Diaz. And it looks like Council Member Riley has additional questions. Council Member Riley. Uh, thank you. Just uh, a remark and one more question. Uh, I love the camera idea. I'm actually going to implement two uh, within my district just to try it out. I love the idea that it's mobile also. So, so thank you so much for doing that. And a follow-up question to um, garbage uh, uh, being picked up by sanitation workers. If a house owner has video of a sanitation worker kind of not putting back the trash can properly, is there any disciplinary action that happens to the worker or, or, or it, what is the pr process of that, if you could prove that? Oh, no, uh, great question. I, it's, it's heartbreaking to us when people forward us complaints of our sanitation workers not bringing the can back or uh, throwing out the can. We've had, we've had them. We suspend the employee. We look into it, and if they have, if they, if you have them on video, we will absolutely take disciplinary action against the sanitation worker involved. We've done it. Um, sadly, we had an incident last week where we just had to do it. Um, and we, most of our employees are incredible. And every now and again, if they're having a bad day or they've done something wrong out there behind the truck, we discipline them for that. I am happy to report that I am usually every single day proud of all members of service. But every now and again, someone does something wrong. And when they do, we have a disciplinary process that we enact on that. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Chair, there are no other council members with questions. If you have any additional questions for the administration. Um, I do not. I just want to thank the Department of Sanitation for their amazing work. Um, arguably the, one of the greatest agencies in, in all of the city of New York. So I just wanna thank you guys for your great work um, and uh, good information. I'm looking forward to hearing testimony from the general public as well, but uh, great job. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Grayson, uh, Chief Harbin and Assistant Chief Cyrus. We will now turn to public testimony. I would like to remind everyone that we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given five minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer and given you the cue to begin. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. And I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would like to now welcome Liz McMillan of We Act for Environmental Justice, followed by Calvis Mickelsteins of the Dumbo Improvement District, followed by Robert Camacho. Liz McMillan, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Liz McMillan, are you still available to testify? If so, please unmute your mic. Okay, we will move on and if she's available, we will come back to her. We will now hear from Calvis Mickelsteins of the Dumbo Improvement District. Calvis uh, Mickelsteins, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Perfect, thank yes, you. Yes, we can hear Good you. Good morning, Chair Reynoso, Commissioner Grayson and distinguished committee members. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Calvis Mickelsteins, Director of Operations at the Dumbo Business Improvement District in Brooklyn. Like many bids in the city, we maintain a robust sanitation program in order to keep the sidewalks and streets clean and clear for New Yorkers and visitors alike. I've come in front of your committee to speak briefly regarding an issue that is ever present, not just in Dumbo, but many parts of the city. 
especially the business districts and commercial corridors. The amount of trash and recycling bags put out for collection by medium and large scale residential and commercial properties is ever increasing, particularly as online ordering and home deliveries continue to grow. These piles of trash bags stacked four to five feet high and lined up on narrow streets is both unsightly and hazardous, spilling into bike lanes and parking spaces. These piles often attract illegal dumping, further exacerbating the situation. In our bid in Brooklyn, this is seen on many streets where residents and visitors alike struggle to navigate around these piles. I've seen individuals pushing strollers unable to pass narrow stretches of sidewalk on Water Street. I've seen cyclists having to leave bike lanes to avoid trash bags. And despite our bid and city sanitation team's best efforts, illegal bags dropped almost every night. I understand that the city budget plays a disproportionate role in DSNY's ability to handle the inordinate amount of waste generated in the city. And so I urge city council members to consider new alternatives to address the issues of improper waste storage and illegal dumping. While increased enforcement would be helpful, stronger interagency ties between DSNY, DOT, DOB, the NYPD, bids and other uh, city bodies concerned with improving the public realm could yield a better understanding of the issues. While there are many potential approaches that could be tested, none will be effective without a comprehensive approach led by City Hall to bring all relevant city agencies to the table. Working together, pilot programs such as the DSNY Clean Curbs program should be extended to include residential properties. Dear committee members, we must think both critically and creatively about solutions to manage waste disposal in dense, heavily trafficked parts of the city. While increased enforcement is helpful indeed, I believe the creative policy solutions paired with technological advances are what we need to solve this issue. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. We will now call on Robert Camacho to testify, followed by Liz McMillan if she is back on. Robert Camacho, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. How are we doing? I want to take the time uh, to thank Antonio and all the all the committee members and also sanitation. I'm just a little, uh, 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 I lived in Bushwick all my life. My father owned a home. We have a two family home. We had two family homes. Now all of a sudden uh, we have these humongous buildings in there. They don't put the garbage out at the time it's supposed to be because I know you're supposed to be giving out tickets. But we talk about tickets all the time. If you're making money and you're making a lot of it, just like the businesses and what he said, uh, uh, guess what? That ticket is nothing to him. But to someone like me that's on a broke income in a two family home, it's a lot. So we, we really need to find out uh, uh, what's going on with that. They're not bringing supers into these buildings to make sure that they sweep their 18 inches in front of their building. So they're not giving jobs for the people in the community. They're bringing that same dirty bucket in the van and cleaning all the other buildings that they're doing. So they're not helping the community, one. Two, in regards to uh, 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 parking, parking is a big issue. I, I clean 18 inches over my curb. I clean the snow, I put salt and sand, I clean it. Now the city has the audacity to turn and bring or uh, 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 bike racks and put everything and disenfranchise the community that I've been there for 40 years cleaning and you put something to make money. That's, that, that's, that's one. Then you turn around and, and, and you move ultimate street side parking and I can't park because across the street there's a bus stop. Up the block is the train. So we got people with out of state plates that live in Bush Street for 30 years, 30 months. By law, they have to change their plates. And I'm paying the, the, the insurance and paying taxes in my property and in my car. And you got out of state plates that don't move their car when it's ultimate. And I told this, the guy from the sweep, I have pictures, Jersey, Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, all the way, they don't move. That $25 is, is nothing to them or that $45 is nothing to them because it's called $300 a month and they're paying $3,000 rent. So they don't care that $45. We need to hit them people on the residential block, no out-of-state plates, commercial plates or out-of-state plates, because they take all the parking in our block and we can't park. 
Now I can't, why is not or have commuter? I'll pay extra taxes to me to keep my park in the front. I'm disabled. I use my car to go to, I can't go nowhere. I'm stuck in with a shopping car because I can't move. When I come back, I got nowhere to go. I can't park nowhere. It takes me three or four hours. One, two, sanitation is doing a good job. They are doing a good job. We need to get these cars to be moved. We need to get these people that are not cleaning the front, 18 inches over the curb, to start picking up their crap. Or not not $25, $45, even me, $50, $60 every time. But if I clean next door and you got a big building next door and he don't clean and everything blows over, then I get the ticket. So is it fair? Because you got an LLC and they don't bring businesses. We need to address those big buildings that are coming into the two and three family homes, our residential blocks that are doing this to us. One, two, the out of state, 18 inches cleaning the curve. 311, forget about 311. I prefer directly working with sanitation because by the time 311 called, we have more garbage than we had when we called it the first time. So that's not working with us. Uh, we really need, watch when the leaves starts falling. That ultimate street side parking that you got one time, what I'm gonna do? move the, the leaves across the street, pick up my end, and everybody else don't pick up and all the leaves come to me. Now everybody get tickets. No, we need a, a, a better approach on that. Community parking. I don't mind paying. I know a lot of people in my block. We have more houses, two and three family homes, and, and people that live in their homes, that are seniors, that are old timers, that are not going nowhere, not selling their property. We have people that want to stay here and invest in our community and continue to make the community like the snow, the, those uh, tree pits, crap all over. You know what they do with the bags? When you're garbage, and, and I want to thank uh, the commissioner because I do that. I take my plastic can, I put it in the curb, I put my bag inside, I put my lid. The bad part is that sometimes I get sanitation since I'm doing a nice job. He go by and pass it. He don't pick the lid up and take the garbage can out and leave. But now I told him there's a garbage there. So now he picks it up, takes my cans and put it across the street, all those bags of garbage. I'm the only one that put it in a rubber can and put the garbage can inside and put the lid. That works because the rats don't go around and they leave. We we really need to afford, we really need to put the bags in there, books are real nice with the lid, because two or three family house, you can do it. Big buildings, we don't know how they can do it. So I want to thank you and take the time uh, for allowing me to testify. And Reynoso, we love you. I know I'm going to work with you, and we're going to have a wonderful time, because I know you're going to be the man for us. Thank you, Camacho. I appreciate it. And I actually have a couple of questions uh, for uh, Assistant Chief or for that, the conversation or the, the, the testimony put forth by uh, Roberto Camacho. Um, are the fine structures similar for let's say a two family home versus someone that has a 10, 10 a building with 10 apartments on it? Um, do they get the same type of fine uh, regardless of the size of their property? Yes, the, the fines are the same. So I'm just saying um, the council members that are here, I mean, there's just a ton, a ton of legislation opportunities here uh, to have the, the the fine structure be the same for a single family home um, as as a you know ten unit building, you're right. It's the cost of doing business um, for them um, versus a homeowner that could be on a fixed income. So I I, I think that that is something that I want to look into for sure. Um, uh, so th that's one. The other one was. Um, uh, Camacho, we're working on this. Uh, it's not necessarily just the community plates. Uh, the illegal, the 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 illegal insurance is insurance. It's scamming. It's insurance scamming. They say that they're from Jersey and from Florida and Pennsylvania. They don't move their cars. It's obviously that they're New York cars, but they want to get cheaper insurance, so they go somewhere else. Um, the people that have to solve for that, we tried here. We can't do that in the council. It has to be the state, the state. So we got to talk to our assembly member and our state senator. Uh, because they can solve for that. Uh, we even had a, a permit where you have to sign up with the Department of Transportation or DMV to get a temporary permit to be able to park in city streets if you have out-of-state plates, which means if you come in from New Jersey, you go to go on a website, on the website, say, I'm going to come to Bushwick for three days, and they will say, oh, that costs you $7, and you put this placard in front of your thing. If you stay longer than a certain amount of time, uh, one, we're getting money off for of that, but if you stay longer, um, they'll give you tickets and or tow your car or whatever it is. Um, we don't even need to charge you or any New York City uh, folks any money. Should we do that? Um, 
the entire scamming uh, industry will go will fall apart. So we want to figure out a way we can solve for this problem where our residents don't get hit. They don't need to pay extra because they're not doing anything wrong. Um, so 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 that's it. Those are the two things. Mm -hmm. Councilman, ahead, I want to, I want, I want to, I want to thank you because I know uh, uh, you're you're not responsible uh, for those for those uh, uh, cars and those uh, uh, people coming here. But but we really need to focus on that because they don't they don't move, and yeah. and the sweeper can't go by. And now yeah. when listen to this, when the people in the block double park because you know double park is illegal, the, mm -hmm. everybody that's double park could get a hundred twenty dollar fine, and the guy that don't move his car. And you get $45 fine. So I'd rather take a chance to get the $45 than $120 park, $115 yeah. for double parking. That's yeah. what I'm trying to tell you. They get in yeah. their car, they wait until the car to get clean. And then these people that don't have out, out of side plate, and then they move up. So you're going to get it. Well, I prefer getting a $45 than $120 yeah, you're right. because yeah. you're double park. So it's it's kind of, it's kind of, and the sweeper can't go by. I'm arguing. The guy is so sad that the guy wants to work, do his job, but he can't go around and he's there 15, yeah. 20 minutes. Cause now yeah. the cars are double park. The guy's with the Jersey, Pennsylvania. And if he does two or three cars go by and that's it. Yeah. We need, there's gotta be done. And the blocks yeah. don't get clean. It don't get yeah. clean at all. Some of the yeah. uh, residential stores, the same thing. The, the owners don't have nobody sweeping in front, cleaning the 18 inches over the curb. Sanitation can only do so much. We gotta start banging them with the tickets. Yes. Every day, yes. every day. If you want, give me a book. I, I go in there and start banging them myself. <laughs> I, I go in there yeah. and start banging everybody. Don't worry. Camacho, about Camacho is I joining the, the caucus, the increased fine caucus. Um, that's that's right. what it is. So Commissioner Cyrus, uh, Chief Cyrus, get to it. The more tickets you give, the, we'll give you the, the bigger uh, cookie basket we'll give you during Christmas. Um, but we really want to make sure that we were focused on that. Thank you, Camacho, for your time. I really appreciate it. Committee Council. Thank you very much for your testimony and thank you, Chair. We will now see if Liz McMillan, if you are, I see you, wonderful. Liz McMillan, um, you may begin when the Sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair, Renoso, and committee members for your time this morning. I am Liz McMillan, and I'm a member of WE Act for Environmental Justice, serving on the Climate Justice Working Group. WE Act is a community-based organization that's been fighting for and with residents in northern Manhattan to address environmental health hazards that disproportionately affect communities of color. Today, I'd like to testify to my experience living in central Harlem with the declining sidewalk and street cleanliness. It seems as though there's more trash and vermin than about three years ago. I can barely walk down the street without a trash and trash wind tunnel left to artifacts as I go. The trash cans provided on street corners are overflowing and left over, if possibly put there, trash from collection day make it hard to enjoy your block on nice weather days. Not to mention the possibility of storm drains becoming overflowed because of trash in the street clogging and making it impossible for rain water to drain properly. If that isn't enough, rodents have now taken over some streets where it's notorious to work, walk down the street, down a block and have several darts back and forth in front of your feet. It's just, just not fun. Not a fun sight, especially at night. And with many construction projects around in Harlem, it seems there's a number has doubled not only is it unsightly, but it has to be highly unsanitary, nor safe for children and pet dogs to have around. There has been more than that. There has to be more that can be done. This is why I felt it important to lend my voice to the testimonies here to ask for the city to step in and do, if not look into it thoroughly, but to take some actions in resolving these issues and help return New York City back into a safer, cleaner city. Thank you for your time for allowing me to provide testimony on such an important issue. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Cherry Noso, do you have any further questions for any of our panelists today? I do not. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, if we have inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify today and is yet to have been called on, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called in the order that your hand has been raised. Seeing none, I will now turn it over to Chair Reynoso to offer his closing remarks. Chair Reynoso. And, and Chair, I, oh, I apologize. Um, we've been joined by Council Member Gibson. Uh, we've been joined by Council Member Gibson. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much to the Committee Council, to the Sergeants, to uh, both Chiefs, uh, Harbin and Cyrus, and our Commissioner for being here with us today. I feel like it was a very productive uh, hearing. Um, there obviously is an increase in the amount of trash we're seeing and we're hoping to solve for it. It seems like a lot of people here are leaning towards more enforcement. Um, we've also learned about opportunities and ways council members can assist the Department of Sanitation with this work. Um, and also how we can lay out our garbage that could uh, be a, that could assist related to rat mitigation and so forth. Just overall, very, a very thoughtful um, and productive hearing. So I'm extremely grateful to everyone. Um, have, a, have a great Monday and rest of the week. Uh, thank you so much. And at this point, uh, this meeting is now.